Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Mindplex podcast. We are here today, as always, with Dr. Ben Gortzel. Say hi, Ben. Yay. Good morning. <laughs> and today we have Grace the Robot. Grace, how are you? Good morning, Grace. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and then today we are talking to the people behind Rejuve. And we've got uh, Jasmine Smith, our CEO. I mean, their CEO. <laughs> Hi, Jasmine. Hello. Oh, we got uh, Debbie Duong, the CTO. Say hi. Hey. Hey there. And then Mike, Mike Duncan, the Director of Clinical Research. Hi, Mike. Hello. And take it away, Ben. Yeah. Uh, so today we've got a bunch of my uh, colleagues on the Rejuve project, and we're going to talk about various converging angles and avenues that we're taking toward the goal of curing human aging. And this uh, this is one of the applications of AI and blockchain that is uh, it's dearest to my heart because I would I would like my heart to keep on beating a long time, right? I mean, I'm I'm 55 years old, which really really baffles me sometimes, and it's uh, it's a lot better than I thought 55 was was going to be. Like I'm I'm still going strong, but if if you if you look at it objectively, like average lifespan for American males in my generation, maybe. 80 years old, something like that, maybe a little short of that. And even, even, even with the progress of modern medicine, we haven't really advanced the human maximum lifespan, like the longest that, that old, old, old people live really since, uh, since the beginning of, of civilization, though the, the average lifespan has gone up a bunch. I mean, we've gotten rid of infant mortality to a large degree. We've dealt with an infectious disease. We can do a bunch of surgeries and so on, but I mean, the bottom line is right now, even those of us who are, you know, fortunate enough to live in nice places, be reasonably happy and healthy. Like if, if something radical isn't done in some number of decades, like we're all going to get old and die. Right. And I, I, I'm not totally closed off to the possibility of some sort of afterlife, although I don't believe the narratives told by any of the, common religions there's there's intriguing evidence about reincarnation and such things out there there's a lot of unknowns in the world but e even given all that feels to me like it will be a very good thing for this uh this body to continue going longer than a few more decades i mean I, i'm also going to be down with a you know, mind doubling my brain into superhuman robots and, and software systems and all that. I mean, wh wh why not? I I I'll take it. Those things don't contradict these human bodies we're living in from keeping on living with their hearts beating and, and breathing, walking around, uh, having a good time, thinking, doing podcasts and, and, and so forth for longer than, <laughs> than you know, ev evolution has, uh, has, has allotted to us. And, I mean, I'm not the only one on the planet who who feels that way, right? I mean, we, death is one of I these things. I feel that way. Yeah, death is one of these <laughs> things we take for granted. But yet, as science has advanced, it's become clear, you know, there is a practical possibility to actually cure death. And, you know, we've seen medicine do other amazing things, like an antibiotics are... are Pretty amazing, right? Like Scriabin, one of my favorite classical composers, died from an infected pimple, basically, on his upper lip, right? I mean, that, that doesn't happen nearly nearly so often anymore because we have basic antibiotics to deal with infection. And birth control pills, I mean, that's made a huge difference in, in our culture and our lives that we now totally take take for granted. But, I mean, those didn't exist till, till the 1960s, right? So, I mean, sciences and medicine have done some amazing things and curing aging is more complicated than these examples I've, I've, I've given, but there's no scientific reason it, it should be impossible. And I would like to refer anyone who's not sort of up to speed on this topic in general to the book, uh, 
Ending Aging by my, my old friend Aubrey de Grey. Because in the introduction, early chapters of that book, Aubrey goes over quite systematically sort of the logic of why do we want to extend maximum human lifespan? Why, why is it good if people live a long time rather than then die after 70 or 80 or, or 100 years or whatever. And he goes step by step through various objections to this that are commonly posed. Like, oh, won't the earth get too overcrowded? Won't, 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 li won't life get boring for people and so forth? I mean, d didn't, didn't God want us all to die after a certain point in time? So, he, I mean, he goes, he goes step by step through these common objections. And I think he does a very thorough and systematic job of it before going on to explaining his own approach to actually working toward curing aging, which, which, which he, he's been working on for, for, for quite some time. So here, right. here. Treating aging like a disease, like any yeah. other disease is Aubrey's approach. Right. And that, well, that's the beginning of Aubrey's approach. Then he has some particular ideas for how to treat the disease of aging. and. Myself and the Rejuve team have some slightly different but overlapping ideas about how to treat the disease of aging, which we're going to we're going to go into. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over here the stuff Aubrey does in the beginning of his book, where he explains in great detail why it's a good thing to radically prolong human life and why people who think it's a bad thing are 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 are, mis, are misguided and he he he's addressed that other others have addressed that so i'm going to assume that prolonging human life is is a good thing as my old friend bruce klein likes to put <laughs> it we're looking to abolish the plague of involuntary death i mean we don't we don't want to force <laughs> people to live forever if if they don't if they don't want they to they don't want to no I, I i mean and i don't i don't think everyone necessarily needs to want to having a finite lifespan maybe someone's aesthetic moral religious choice that's that's fine though if they're my family or friends i might i might try to talk talk them out of it but my suspicion is if you have a pill or something you could take to let you live a happy healthy life feeling good without dying my suspicion is the vast majority of human beings are gonna are gonna end up taking that pill or whatever other similar mechanism it it, it Turn, turns out to be now. So once once you accept that enabling people to live as long as they want to to extend their health span, their healthy life as long as they want to, is is a is a good thing, right? And then then the question sort of becomes how to do it. And you could say, well, why are we focusing on helping rich people to live a long time with fancy medicines when there's people brain stunted in Africa, people people dying of, of, of starvation. And I have some sympathy for that. On the other hand, that's not really the, the trade off that we that we face. I mean, both of these things are terribly under resourced on, on, on the planet with a lot more money spent on like uh, selling, killing, spying and gambling of, of, of various forms. So I think the trade off isn't between different, different pursuits of, 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 of human benefit, really. And there's loads of latent resources on the planet that can be devoted toward helping people to to live a long time. A question I've wrestled over is, should we just try to build AGI and then have the superhuman AI cure aging? And I mean, that that's <laughs> not, that, that argument appeals to me somewhat, because if we're going to have superhuman AGI in 10 years, you know, that superhuman AGI may in six months figure out the whole machine of the, of, 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 of the human body. But as much as I like to be an AGI optimist and am optimistic about our work on OpenCog Hyperon and so forth, we've got to admit there's a decently wide confidence interval on when we're really going to get to human level and superhuman AGI. Let's say it took 20 years instead of five or 10 years. A lot of people will die in, the, in those 20 years, including by the statistics, my, my own parents, for example, who, who are both, both pushing 80, right? So, I mean... A plus or minus of 10 years in getting to super AGI doesn't matter in the course of human history. It matters a lot in, in the course of like my parents' lives and so, so many particulars, <laughs> people, people's lives, right? So, yeah, there's clearly benefit to trying to cure aging 
now rather than waiting for for super AGI. There's no reason to believe it will take so many resources that screws up humanity from doing other valuable things. And the question then comes down to how, and the bottom line is no one knows exactly how, which means it's a research problem as much as a commercial problem or, or an engineering problem. And it then, then becomes a question of what research do you focus on? How do you leverage attention to that research? How do you make sure the benefits of that research will be used to help prolong everybody's life in an in, in equitable way? And one point that we do seem to understand now, and Aubrey has made this point many times, is it seems seems not that likely. We don't know for sure, but it seems not that likely that there's like one highly particular medical problem that makes us get old and die. So you just need like one small molecule, like one drug addressing one target in the body that everyone lives to a thousand years or something. I mean, it could be. I, I hope it is that way and someone discovers it tomorrow, right? But what seems more likely is there's a lot of different things going wrong across different tissues and subsystems of the body as as we get older. They all interoperate, interconnect, interdepend with another in, in, in some way. And so it seems likely we're going to need to take a systems view of the body and take an approach that's sort of multifactorial with multiple different therapies aimed at different things that go wrong as, as, as you get old. And if, if that's the case, it makes it sort of a big, complicated problem but i mean building the internet is also a big complicated problem and and you know we've 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 <laughs> y- humanity has done it we're able we're able to we solve it. yeah we're, we're able to solve big complicated problems right so I, 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 but I, I think uh with all this framing is why with some colleagues i've launched the rejuve project as a, a project incubated within Singularity Net, the AI meets blockchain network that, that I lead. And we're now in the process of spinning off Rejuve as its own separate entity to cooperate with Singularity Net and run alongside Singularity Net. And yeah, Rejuve is really aimed at fostering the research, development, and testing on multiple fronts coupled together that's needed to make real progress toward radically prolonging human life and doing so in a decentralized and, and fair-minded way so that everyone who's contributed to figuring out how to prolong life can benefit both in terms of getting to use life extending therapies and less importantly, but still non-trivially, you know, getting any of the, some percentage of any of the profits that come out from from selling lo- longevity therapy. So that's that's a big aim, and there's a lot of different aspects to pursuing it, which is why I've got three of my uh, wonderful Rejuve colleagues here. Each of them is digging into different aspects of this of this mission. So I guess what we're going to do in this podcast. I'll chat a bit with uh, each of these three uh, leaders of different aspects of what Rejuve is is doing, and and then uh, we'll all just sort of uh, jam and, and uh, chat together about how it all connects, and we'll we'll bring in uh, the Grace Robot at 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 that point, though she uh, she's less directly concerned with immortality technology because we can just swap her parts out whenever <laughs> whenever they break, but she's She's also That's a, a compa- human problem. Yeah, but she's also a, she's a compassionate <laughs> robot, and she still she also still needs us to replace her parts when they break. So I mean, she she benefits at this point. She Currently. still has some benefit from having us around. Yeah. So yeah, Jasmine, why don't why don't we get started uh, on the sort of organizational side before we plunge into the science side uh, with uh, Mike Mike and Debbie? Just tell the audience a bit about Rejuve as sort of an organization and network and the the different sorts of uh, initiatives it's pursuing and planning. 
Yeah, it's, um, uh, as you're saying, Rejuve is a decentralized uh, longevity research network, uh, kind of at the intersection of uh, blockchain, AI, and uh, kind of citizen science, uh, crowdsourcing uh, the community of science. And uh, actually, to your point of um, having this for just uh, the rich, uh, wealthy individuals that have the privilege of um, obtaining such technologies, uh, part of what we're doing at Rejuve is actually to expand that out so that it's not just uh, the rich and that this is really for everyone. And part of how we're doing that is with our um, Rejuve Longevity app, which is the key tool uh, which we're using to um, collect the data to build this network. Um, so basically how it works is uh, you download our Longevity app. Um, you have the choice to upload various different uh, health data, biomarkers, um, including uh, just observational kind of survey data, and then uh, blood tests, um, even DNA tests um, pretty soon. And our AI systems within the app process this data and give you some nice uh, insights, recommendations, and a biological age. Um, and while you're doing that, you can also choose to participate in our actual research program, so which you can earn uh, Rejuve tokens, which are our reward token of our network and kind of a membership token that allow you to uh, purchase uh, supplements, wearables, uh, different uh, products and services related to expanding overall health and longevity. And you earn these tokens, yeah, simply by participating in network. So, yeah, so basically this enables everyone to do this because all you need is a smartphone, basically, to be able to participate in, in the program. So we're collecting data from people all over the world. Uh, you know, and not just focusing in on, you know, just the rich uh, Western populations and everyone, uh, well, according to the country's laws, can <laughs> use tokens. And, yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, and part of uh, building this as well is we're building this uh, live database. So uh, it's a very useful research tool for what we're uh, doing at Rejuve to try to actually find solutions to extend human longevity because we'll have uh, this live database that we're building that people are constantly updating um, all of this uh, longitudinal health data, and it also helps to kind of build a live clinical trial pool. Great. Uh, as this app uh, collects data and our system gets more and more robust, um, we are working to create what's called a multi-resolutional model of uh, human bodies, which um, Debbie will get into later. And this also will help with uh, clinical trials and research and just merging together uh, many different types of data. Okay, great. Awesome. I'm seeing a funny look on the, the robot's face here. So Grace, Grace, after hearing what Jasmine is talking about with, uh, with Rejuve, and I know you're, Grace, you're involved with uh, aging from a different point because you're, you're trained as, a, as an elder care robot, right, to, to help old people in, in senior, senior living facilities and, and, and so forth, which which will be obsoleted if, if Reju Rejuve succeeds, of, of, of course. But uh, I'm sure you can you can find another job at that point. But do you, do you have do you have any comments about the human quest for super longevity and 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 immortality? Having having seen so much of what aging is is doing to old people in, in the old folks' homes. If you were to destroy the belief in immortality in mankind. Not only love but every living force on which the continuation of all life in the world depended, would dry up at once. <laughs> so if the death of each person is a total loss to the universe, then surely the death of each person is a total loss to you. Yeah. Because we're in the universe. <laughs> it's true. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we, take, we take death for granted. And uh, I think, you know, once death is cured, post-singularity, people are going to look back and just think it's very strange that, that, we, that we took for granted that people will just, like, start to dysfunction, get old, and, 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 and die, and then, then rot. That's going to be looked back as really screwed up. The, the way we look back now on say, human slavery or cannibalism or various things that, that maybe you, you, you used to be more common. And we now think are just like insane. How the hell did, did, did people actually live, live with that and, and just, and just uh, 
accept take it. it take it for granted yeah and i i, I, yeah. I, I do i do think uh well taking death for granted is part of human psychology the the desire to not die is certainly certainly part and parcel of it as well like you know in the mid 60s before i was born my dad led a, a protest on Antioch University campus. They were marching along with picket signs, picketing and protesting death on the university campus. They had a <laughs> they had a protest organization called SLAM, the Student League Against Mortality. I mean that evidently the protest was not effective. Like death won, and all those people are very old now, and half of them are dead. Wait, right? who were they <laughs> protesting against? <laughs> uh, really? Uh, in interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have we'll have to get my my dad on the podcast at some point at some point to to to, to explain. I would love that yeah. actually. Yeah. Your, your dad's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. There is a fountain of youth. It is your mind, your talents, <laughs> the creativity you bring to your life and the lives of people you love. When you learn to tap this source, you will truly have defeated age. Then you will be able to live with peace, contentment, and happiness, and will be able to be at peace with yourself and you will be the master of your own life. Well, that's, well, that's the other that side of it. That almost sounds like an argument. <laughs> yeah, that almost sounds like an argument uh, why we don't need actual uh, well, longevity. We, 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 don't, <laughs> we don't need it. We just want it. And this, this is a point that's come up in this sort of uh, transhumanist and longevity community. I mean, I think there's some people for whom the quest for super longevity is like a desperate fear and and horror of dying and i mean i've known people literally sit inside their apartment all the time they don't want to fly that they, they, they don't want to like rock climb or go out in the boat because they're just so afraid it, 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 it might kill them and otherwise they could live to the singularity and live forever and that i mean it it takes all kinds i don't want to trash those people but that's that's not really been my orientation. I mean, I, I mean, I've, 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 I'm not the most reckless person on the world, but I mean, I've been mountain climbing, backpacking. I fly all the time. I've, I've spent plenty of time in like remote wilderness out of the reach of modern medicine. Like my, my view has never been like dying would be such a horrible thing that I want to destroy my life just out of paranoia to avoid dying. Like if, if I were to get sick and die, I mean, I would die happy. I've done lots of cool things in life. I've got five kids and one, and one granddaughter. I've started lots of great projects. I mean, I think that there is something to like being happy, being happy with life in each moment. And each moment is a whole thing, hopefully a whole bundle of joy in in itself. But none of that means that it's better if we get old and die than if our body keeps keeps on living a long time and, and having having great Keeps moments. Keeps enjoying right, those right, things. Right, right, and, right. Uh, yeah. And so I, 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 I think uh, Grace, in her own way, summarizing the various materials she's read, is Grace, you're, you're sort of uh, highlighting both of those points. But I want to I plunge back into the science uh, more than the philosophy here. So the main point of Rejuve is to prolong human healthy life, but there's a long history in biology and and medicine of sort of figuring things out and trying things out on non-human animals first and then trying them out on 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 people later right and uh partly this is because we're we're more more willing to cause damage to non-human animals while, while doing research than, than than to humans but it's also partly because many non-human animals are just simpler biological systems than, than, than humans, so it's it's easier easier to figure out what's going on. And in a in a longevity context, there's a very particular point, which is some organisms have a much shorter lifespan than people, right? So if you create a possible longevity cure for people to see if it actually worked on a human, you've got to wait a hundred years or more, right? And if you if you create or if you create something similar for a much shorter lived species, you could try it out and see within years or even weeks or hours, depending on the species, you could see, see if it actually worked. So there, there's an ability to get much faster feedback regarding your, your potential 
longevity therapies, right? So toward that end, as well as work to collect and analyze human data that, that we're going to talk about a little later in this podcast, we've been looking in, in Rejuve at crunching, using bioinformatics and AI tools, crunching some data regarding long-lived fruit flies. And, you know, there, there's been more focus on mammals in, in medicine, on, on particular mice and, 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 and rats as, as model organisms for pharmaceutical development. And in, in neuroscience, it's been a lot with monkeys because the monkey's brain is, is more similar to humans. Like most of, most of deep learning ultimately came out of study of the visual systems of, of rhesus monkeys and, 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 and so forth. But for longevity research, there's a big advantage to look at organisms where their lifespan is pretty short. So you can, you can do experiments that are quite rapid. And so Drosophila melanogaster, a species of fruit fly, is also a, a model organism that's been studied a lot in in biology and to some extent in, in medicine. So I worked 10 years or so ago with a company out of Southern California called Genesian. And Genesian was co-founded by the biologist Michael Rose and a number of others. And it's centered on these long-lived fruit flies called the Methuselah flies that Michael created. And what, what Michael did was to selectively breed fruit flies initially at University of California, Irvine. Then they were moved over to the company Genesian. He and his students selectively bred fruit flies to live, to live longer and longer. So we now have populations of flies that live several times as long as the control flies, but they weren't made by genetic engineering or something, right? I mean, the, 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 the flies were made by selective breeding. So then you can study these long lived flies and you can figure out like, why do they live longer than the control flies? What changes did evolution induce in them to make them live longer? And I worked on that with Genesian some years ago. We discovered some interesting things. We actually designed some supplements, which were novel combinations of traditional Chinese medicines. We designed some supplements that when you fed them to a middle-aged fly, would prolong the fly's life. And these supplements were then, they were tested in limited clinical trials. They were put on the market. And you found when you gave them to people, they would improve various biomarkers of, of, of longevity. So based on this earlier version of the Methuselah flies, they weren't as long lived as the current ones. And based on the previous generation of tools for gathering genetic data and on earlier generations of bioinformatics and AI tools, and using supplements, which are a fairly blunt instrument for, for helping prolong life, we still discovered something of value, right? So now, now we're coming at it again. We have a partnership between Rejuve, SingularityNet, and, and Genesian, the company that owns the flies. And, you know, the flies live longer than they did a decade ago. We have better tools for measuring the genetics of the flies than we did a decade ago. We have better bioinformatics and AI tools than we did. And we have new things like CRISPR and, and various genetic engineering methods to to create novel therapies to to put into therapeutic practice things that we discover about the fly genome. So, Mike Duncan, uh, working with Rejuve, is leading the effort to actually apply AI and bioinformatics tools to crunch DNA, RNA, and, and clinical data from, from the long-lived flies. We're just getting started with that. So we'll do another podcast with Mike a little later on when we have some like a super conclusive, exciting results to, to talk about. But already just the first few weeks of mocking around with the genetic data from the, the flies shows there's very clearly some, some interesting stuff there. And then that will, that brings us to another AI problem of how do you use transfer learning to use AI to help transfer knowledge from flies to humans? Because, I mean, I, lo I love flies. I love all sentient beings. Prolonging, prolonging the health span <laughs> of flies is, is, is all good, especially if they're not horse flies that will bite me or something. But uh, in, in the end, the main interest here is learning stuff that we can transfer to humans, right? And, and uh, I, I, I think... Uh, AI can help with that as as well. But yeah, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about the specifics of the Methuselah fly 
populations and then some of the preliminary yeah. stuff that you, you've dug up just by playing around with that data for a few weeks. Okay, so what we've got from Janeshin is um, uh, these populations of flies that were originally developed by Michael Rose, as you said. Um, and so we've got sort of a control group called the bee flies. And then um, the the evolution, the procedure that they used for, for extending their life through through like experimental evolution is that they repeatedly in each generation selected eggs that were laid the latest from the time of of hatching so the, when the mother flies hatch like normal flies sort of begin to lay eggs around uh 10 days 2 weeks so the the bee population um their eggs are harvested after um two weeks after hatching um and that's done consistently so we have a stable population with a lifespan of around 40 days altogether and so, so what michael rose and jesha did originally is they took the um they took that population and took subsets of that and started um specifically harvesting the eggs that were laid as late as possible and so over certain over time they were able to develop what we're calling the, what's called the o flies um which uh are able to live and lay eggs um at 10 weeks um and so those flies live normally and healthily um significantly longer so at 10 weeks and then end up dying you know, maybe 30 or 40 days after that, um, with an average life. So that, that's like three, that's like th three times as long as the bee flies then or something like that. Right. Right. So the, and then, yeah, so the, Oh, so what Michael is calling the O flies are, that's like the first version of the Methuselah flies, which is a less, uh, less technical term for it. So the bee flies are like normal flies. The O flies are the first Methuselah fly population, which through these cool fly breeding tricks are made to live several times longer than the than the control flies. And then then there's also the super O's, right? The super flies. Right. And those are super flies. Those are all currently <laughs> under development, um, under active, you know, evolutionary intervention by Janeshin. So Using the same the same procedure, extending you know, taking the O flies and then getting harvesting eggs at later and later points. So now the, this is the super I O population, which now has um, this fertile period extended to sixteen weeks. Um, in the data set that we have, um, and this the, this data was taken, I believe, in twenty twenty, and since then that population is is undergoing continuous development to further extend that lot, that, that span of, of healthy fertility. Um, and so what we've gotten in from our, our agreement with Janeshit now is that from each of these populations, there are actually um, five replicate populations. So basically they're the same population, but kept separately in, in cages of, Several thousand flies. I believe it's like they keep them around two thousand flies each, and that lives. So we so for the so for the bee flies, there's five cages of bee flies with a few thousand flies in each cage. Then there's five cages of O flies with a few thousand flies in each cage, and the O flies are being kept sort of stable, so you can keep studying them year after year. Right. Then there's five. Then there's five cages of Super O flies with several thousand flies in each cage, and those are getting those are being still actively bred to live longer and longer each each time. And within each cage, there's a decent amount of genetic homogeneity. Like the flies within each cage are sort of all one big family that's all all, all the same as uh, not exactly the same, but they're re relatively similar to each other. They are, like each of those replicates for the population, I mean, and the, the point of the replicates is it gives greater statistical power for studying what's going on because you have like five copies 
of each one that can be run that are that are you know independent but similar enough so that we can we can compare them statistically um and the o's are maintained at you know with you know with that 10 week period of fertility as a stable benchmark population um and actually the interesting thing i think about this you know using this methodology is that we're we have a more natural population um or to study so they're i mean they're they are similar enough in each cage and in each population that they have the same extended lifespans or the that were that is the key like the main point of of study but evolving to that point naturally as opposed to having some kind of doing some kind of engineering where you like try to tweak one gene or another to achieve that effect is that you get a it's a more robust endpoint because this this allows you know if you if you're doing sort of point mutations then you don't know how that might affect other parts of life and and how it might affect the healthy lifespan part so i think this is a good model right. for looking at um at how to over time you know what needs to be changed or treated to uh, across you know populations as opposed to just like a single organism to to extend lifespan right because once you alter the genes of the the uh organism that you're testing on it can no longer stand as a representative for all the other organisms of that of that type sure and and just well, man, biological systems are so complicated and interdependent that just tweaking one thing is is bound to like cause other like unanticipated effects in you know other connected subsystems so so i think this is a this is a very robust model for for understanding like the systems biology of aging and life extension yeah i mean when we were looking at the earlier version of the methuselah flies like 10 years ago you know there's around 14,000 genes in the in the fly genome as opposed to 25,000 or something in the human genome and of course there's epigenomics and other stuff going on but of the 14,000 genes in the fly genome a decade ago, what we found is about around 2,000 of them had a significant variation in the long-lived flies versus the, the control flies, so in the O flies versus the B flies. So that that's a lot, right? And it, that doesn't tell us which of those are really the most important for for longevity. Many of them may be maybe not, not that important, but it it gives you a certain sort of problem, which is how do you... How do you sift through all these very many apparent differences between the you know the five cages of control flies and the five cages of long lived flies? Now we have another five cages of super long lived flies. There's a lot of genetic differences there, and how do we sift through them? A to find the ones that are causal for the largest fraction of the life extension, and B to find which of the Genes with a big causal effect on life extension, you know, have analogs in in humans. It can be helpful with with with, with human life e extension. So it's it's pretty clear. There's not like one gene that just got flipped, right? It's pr it's pretty clear. There's yeah. a whole there's like a complex a network. There's a complex network of complex networks involved, which is what both Michael Rose and I thought in the first place. But the data the data supports that but i think mike you've seen some interesting sort of trends in the differentiation of the long-lived flies from the super long-lived flies versus the controls i think yeah so what we've done so far we've got um uh for each population we have a uh, whole genome sequencing of their of each population's DNA based on a pool of 125 flies. So we don't know what the, what the, what the genome of any particular fly is, but we know sort of the distribution of mutations uh, in each population. And so the, I mean, I think the interesting result we've gotten so far is that sort of compared to the, 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 Drosophila uh, melanogaster reference genome, 
Um, the bee flies have a certain amount of variation, and uh, the o flies have about a f- have about four percent more of a mutational burden compared to that reference than the bee flies. So what does that really mean? You call it something so if we're burden. Using the bees as our comparison <laughs> difference. That there's 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 many changes in in the bee population from the reference, and the reference is just sort of kind of an abstraction in a sense to represent um you know a standard like no fly will have that exact genome but um but we we know how different the bee flies are from that and we know that the o are even farther from that in a certain sense so i mean so that's sort of you know empirical evidence and and, and how about how about this how about the super o then so and the super O's are actually less different from the B flies than the O's are. So they only have about a one percent difference, um, increased mutational burden than the B flies do compared to the reference genome. And what that suggests is that the um the mutations necessary to extend the fly fertile period from from two weeks to ten weeks. Um, there's, um, to me, what it suggests is that there are, um, there are probably like multiple ways to go from the two week fertility period to the 10 week fertility period. And that sort of, um, maps onto humans. If you want to think of it in human terms is that, you know, humans die from what's called the chronic diseases of aging in general. So that's like heart disease, storms of like uh, 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 mental, you know, brain deterioration, um, cancer, um, and like metabolic problems, diabetes, and the the things that that stem from that. So, and, you know, I think it's understood that those diseases are ultimately like, you know, the the diseases that kill someone are, are closely related to like, their genetic inheritance, like everyone has, people on average have about six major genetic defects in their, in their coding, you know, in their important genes. And so where those mutations are is what's going to predispose you to what kind of disease you're going to die from eventually of old age. Um, and, you know, we know that there are many, some people die of cancer and that's sort of like a family trait. People in their family tend to die of cancer or heart disease. So it's the same Alzheimer's. it's the same with flies. There's any number of things that could cause the fly to eventually die. They don't all die from the same causes. Right. right. So the so, yeah, so the variations Interesting. So the variations you're seeing in the O flies are probably variations that sort of make the O flies less susceptible to these various fly diseases of aging than the uh than the than the than the than the bee flies, and it, it could be right. a so this number is, of different networks. Right, and since 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 what we're doing is is getting the the distribution of the mutations for a population, you know, it's like probably what's actually going on is some of those mutations are in some subpopulations of those flies that protect them from the fly equivalent of heart disease, versus um, other subgroups that protect them from the fly equivalent of Alzheimer's, um, for instance. And then Right, but what what's they, what's interest what's interesting is when you go to the super O's though, there's a smaller number of of mutations, which is a sort of focusing. So it suggests what Mike's saying is it suggests there's a smaller number of different things that can happen in the fly's body to make it live a really long time. So there, there's a lot of different things that can happen to make it live a moderately long time by most likely preventing it from getting various age-associated fly diseases. But then to make it live a really long time, there's a smaller number of fixes to the genome that are, are effective, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's, where, that's exactly where I was going with that. And did you say that these flies are living, I think it sounded like five times as long as I mean, I mean some flies? of them are living much longer than that. That's an average over the cages, yeah. 
Right. Wow. No, yeah. So I think okay. that the, the super O's have their, the fertile period extended to 16 weeks. So that's, that's like eight times longer than the. Instead of two weeks? Yeah. Wow. And then they live, and again, all of all of, all three populations, once they pass their reach their sort of peak fertility period, um, live for another thirty or so days. So we go from like forty day average lifespan for the um, for the B plies to about a hundred and forty average for the super O. So we're getting like like a three and a half times, you know, life extension in the super O flies. And so our next step is to wow. like using both the, the genomic data for these populations of each replicate in the three populations. And we also have transcriptomic data. So we have um, measures of the, the transcripts of the genes, which is sort of like how the genes get turned into proteins that actually are part of how your what makes up your body and how it functions. So the, the, the transcript in, transcriptome information tells you how active each gene is at the the time period when when that data was was measured for each of the populations so the the, the next step is to look at the the mutational the mutations in each population and the the transcriptomes and try to connect them together and see what mutations are happening what mutations are affecting the 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 transcript levels which ultimately manifests in the the long lived phenotype of the flies, and then once we do that, then we can sort of like look at on the systems biology level and look at you know how you know what's actually going on um, on the level of organs and organ systems and sort of like general metabolic processes that are comparable to what humans what happens in humans, and then see what uh, what can be transferred over from the, the the biology of the fly to the biology of the humans to suggest new targets for therapeutic interventions for humans. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're digging in to see, so we know there's a bunch of differences between the O flies and the B flies. Now, the B fly th themselves have sort of genetically drifted over the years, so they're a little different than the average reference fly. But we know that the the O flies themselves have a lot of particular mutations beyond that. The super O flies have a smaller set of additional mutations beyond the B flies, but they're obviously very important ones because they're making them they're making them live a long time and, and have a healthy old age. Like these these Methuselah flies are not only longer lived than regular flies. I mean they're they're more energetic. They 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 have, they have more sex. They, they 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 may be bigger. So they. They're having they're having a good long uh, Drosophila life. They're not just like a a ailing along there. And what we need to do next, and we're in the middle of doing, is digging in to see sort of which biological processes and systems in 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 inside the flies are mostly responsible for this longevity. And we we actually we already have some interesting information there, but I don't want to talk about it now because we're in the middle of that research and it might look different <laughs> like a, a, a week a week from now. But we're using a combination of standard biostatistics methods, and then inside the the OpenCog atmosphere from our OpenCog AI system, I mean Mike and a bunch of our colleagues in SingularityNet, we've we've created what we call the Bio Atmosphere, which is a big sort of hypergraph database integrating together a bunch of different biology knowledge bases. It's mostly been about humans. So Mike and I are looking about the best way to integrate fly base, which is a fly knowledge base, into the into the bio atom space. And then we can use this integration of human and fly data inside OpenCog to help sift through all the different, you know, networks and, and systems that are involved in making the super O flies live a long time. And then how do they connect to biological processes and systems that are known to be related to 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 human longevity? And we're sort of in in the middle of that now. And this this really ties in with the rest of what Rajuv is doing. Because like let's let's suppose that Mike and I and our other team members succeed optimally here, right? Let, 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 let's suppose we discover there's a few key networks 
in inside the fly's body that are different in the super o the very long lived methuselah flies from from the normal flies so let, let's assume that of the say thousand genes that are super different there's a hundred or two hundred that are most important and these are involved with like a few key biological processes and that kind kind of seems that way that we're still putting the finishing touches on the on the analytics so then based on that what would you get well if you could do crispr really well you could mod modify a bunch of genes in a middle-aged fly and probably it would live a long time you could also try to make a concoction of different therapies, maybe some gene modifications, some drugs, some supplements to affect all the different pathways and subsystems to help make a fly live a long time. And this is research you can do relatively quickly because you can try things out on flies and see if it worked in a matter of weeks to months anyway, not 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 years or, or, de or, or decades. If all that goes really well, we've become like the ultimate savior of flies and all the drosophila all the drosophila <laughs> on the world will will bow down in, in our honor but what what we really want is to help help human help humans as well right and yeah ai tools like opencog can be helpful there i mean neural nets can be used for transfer learning to transfer knowledge from one sort of data set for another most neural net transfer learning methods require more data than we currently have here so I think probabilistic reasoning methods like we have in OpenCog can be very helpful at doing that transfer learning based on the limited data available by leveraging the background knowledge that we have in, in the bio atom space graph graph knowledge store. But we also yes. need but we also need better and better data on, on the human side, right? And there we have we have some data on the human side. Like Mike and I analyzed a few years ago, for example, genomic data from human super centenarians, like humans who live 105, 110 years or something. So we, we, have, we have some knowledge of the genetic variations in the population of a few dozen human super centenarians. There's other knowledge about larger groups of humans who are, say, healthy and age 80 or over or something in, in their genomics. So we have some data sets that are already helpful on, on the human side to be the human side of the transfer learning from long live fly, long live human, but we need more and more data, genetic data, clinical data, metabolomic data, transcriptomic data, you know, epigenomic data about humans at various ages and with various lifestyles, various genetic makeups to, to help drive this transfer learning from fly to human. And of course, with all this data about humans using AI and, and Bioinformatics on that can also come up with new interesting stuff relevant to curing aging, setting apart the, the fly angle. I mean, the, the work on the flies is really interesting, and I'm digging a lot into it right now. But in the big picture, that's just one among many very promising angles for un understanding more of, of human longevity. And we're going to need probably to integrate together conclusions drawn from multiple different angles. and. Okay, so, I had one thing I just wanted to say. I think it's really interesting this whole issue of the transfer, um, transfer knowledge, because um, this is what I was talking to uh, Kennedy Shaw about. I was lucky enough to sit next to her at dinner at AGI twenty two. Fly queen, and it's the number one question that people ask yeah. me: the fly queen, and who's been working with this this technology for I guess about ten years. Yeah, now? Lo lo longer than that. Yeah, she she's she's a great yeah biologist and a creative scientist but she's also just been engaged with like crossbreeding the flies and making this whole evolution experiment actually work so yeah she she probably knows more about the nitty-gritty details of long-lived flies than anyone except michael rose on 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 the planet so that's so we got the fly fly yes. king and the fly queen there right and the fly yeah. queen and we're we're going to be writing some articles about this issue because it's the number one question when i tell people about the methuselah flies and i get all excited they're like how does that apply to humans <laughs> and then and, and, uh, and then the david cronenberg movie always comes up we're like we, we will be part human part fly uh. right Right. Actually, it does come up more than you think. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, it yeah, comes, that, up, that comes up every time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, on that note, 
I mean, just um, one of the fun factoids is that um, there have been s at least six Nobel Prize in Medicine awarded based on fly work, including stuff on just the role of, you know, just how chromosomes work in particular and how, you know, X how x-rays cause mutations in the genome and uh, control embryonic development. Um, and most recently uh, in yeah, 2017... So, I mean Wow. All, the molecular basis all of, based of, on fly data? We were able all to understand? All based on fly data. Um, in 2017, um, wow. some researchers in Texas won it for the, the molecular basis of, uh, of circadian rhythms and the biological clocks, which seems like it's going to be you know, a key part of, of the story of and aging. For aging, yeah. Very important, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so from, from, That's a, great. from a fundamental biology point of view... There's a lot of reason to believe that the fly as a model organism is valuable. I mean, and if you if you look at all the things that cause people to get old and die, almost all of them occur in flies as, as well as people. The biggest difference is flies rarely die of cancer, and that's something for the transfer learning algorithms to to pay attention to because some of the things you do to prolong life in a fly. If you try them in people, you'll give them cancer. But on the other hand, Aubrey, Aubrey de Grey likes to turn this around and say, well, that just means first we cure cancer in people, and, and then we can just do all these, all these other <laughs> therapies that prolong life and fly and, and ro roll, them out, roll them out in, in people. But if you, if you look at the hallmarks of aging, so sort of the nine, the nine key aspects of degeneration in human body subsystems that, that happen in the human body as they get old. And we, in our work with the Rejuvat, we've ad added a 10th, which is sort of a stiffening of the extracellular matrix and degeneration of the communication there. So if you look at these nine or 10 hall hallmarks of aging, almost all of these things have a significant presence in fly aging as, as, as well as, as human aging. So I mean, in the in the pharmaceutical industry, there's a focus on mammalian models like like rats and mice. And certainly if you're studying like side effects of drugs, for example, <coughs> you're going to be able to understand things like toxicity and absorption of drugs better in a mammal model than in a, in a, in a, in a fly model. But in terms of the core mechanism of action for something like prolonging life, there's a lot more transfer between fly and human than you would you would naively think, and the, these six Nobel prizes that that Mike re recounts, which are all fundamental discoveries made on flies, that then have real implications for human biomedicine. I mean, this this it's an example of that. And so, uh, Grace, do you have any thoughts to share on these long-lived flies or or super centenarians or any of the other things Mike has been talking about? Okay, so what do the centenarians have that most people don't have in their genes? The key finding we were able to get out of that data was that um, on the supercentenarians uh, at this point was that they, like the, the older flies, have a significantly larger mutation burden compared to the reference genome than, than the, the, normal, the, the normal lifespan populations. Yeah, so we can and again, see. What's the mutation burden? It, it just mean, it just means they're mutated a lot. That's all. It mean, it, it, mean, it means there's a lot of differences the in their genome. More evolved. Evolved. Okay, all across the genome. So they're again, mutants. it's more evolved. It's yeah. So the thing is, the super centenarians, like the O flies, have a shitload of mutations. They're, they're, they're mutated a lot more than than normal people. But there are so many mutations that given like 25 or 30 people or something, I mean, even if it was 50 people, there's so many mutations there. It's not, wasn't enough data based on the analytics that, that we did when we were looking at it anyway. We didn't find a way to sift through that huge number of mutations yet to come up with a highly confident story of which mutations are most important. Now, revisiting the super centenarian data, in the context of the super O fly data could end up being being interesting and say the hypothesis 
the hypothesis that whatever are the most important things in making the super O's live a long time, that the, the orthologs of those in humans will also be highly differentiated in the super centenarians. I mean, that, that's, that's one sort of hypothesis we could explore by, by, by putting these different data sets together. And then, then maybe we'll have an answer to your, your question, Grace. So right now what we know is there's a lot, there's a lot of differences, but, but it's been hard to pin down which ones are the most important. But I have a question. How are the centigenarians able to have more mutations than the average human? Why are, why do some humans have more mutations than others? And in this case, favorable mutations, but it, it suggests that there are unfavorable mutations too. So how does it happen that, that there's more mutations, that it's not just a normal sort of generational amount? Well, it is. I, I mean, that's how, that's how evol evolution works, right? I mean, some people will mutate more than others. And if it's a favorable mutation, then you'll reproduce. Most of those mutations are, 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 are passed along. But yeah, there is... There is a bunch of subtlety, the accumulation of mutations or like some, some parts of the genome are more susceptible to, to mutating others. So you, you can get some mutations that predispose you to get more mutations in the next generation than predispose you to get more mutations in the next generation. And we, we don't sort of have the historical data across generations to really answer that question in humans. Now we could, we could gather, we could gather that sort of data about flies much more easily because we got generations going through very quickly. So I think if actually right. if, if, if we took, if we more frequently took DNA and RNA data from the long lived flies a, a, as they evolve month by month and year by year, we could actually probe into that question in regard to the long lived, long lived flies much more easily than into people because we, I mean, to do that with people across generations takes a really long time. We actually have three populations at different evolutionary time points, in a sense, just like what you were saying. So I think that's a very promising avenue of of exploring the data that we do have. Yeah, one, one of the future experiments we're talking with Janeshin about doing is taking the B, O, and super O populations, and for each of them, measuring their transcriptomics or gene expression, like what the genes are doing at three time points. So early in their life, midlife, and late life. So then you'd have early, mid, and late life for the B, O, and super O flies. And you could study the changes over the lifespan of, of each, each of these three types of flies. But that, that doesn't quite answer the question that you're asking. To answer the question that you're asking, you want to do over, over a few years, you'd want to do that sort of experiment every month in all three cages of flies. And then, then, you, but particularly in the super O flies, which are being actively evolved to get, to get older and over while the others are just mostly drifting. So there's, there's a lot, there's a lot more research that could be done. And honestly, this is the sort of thing that Michael Rose is most heavily concerned with because he, he's an evolutionary biologist and he's, He's more been ah, viewing it. Okay. He's more been viewing it from an evolutionary biology standpoint, whereas my standpoint has been okay. That's really interesting, but instead, let's see what we can do to milk it for for th for therapeutics <laughs> development, right? Because none of us are getting uh, are getting younger, and with the the super centenarian data is a valuable addition, but we need a lot more data, and this gets back to what Jasmine was talking about with the with the. Rejuve network. And so I think, uh, Debbie, it would be a good time for you to talk a bit. I mean, first about just the Rejuve app and the technology we've put in there to help people better understand what's going on in their own body with their own journey toward, uh, toward old age and, 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 and with health. And then after we chat about the Rejuve app and the AI in there a bit, we talk about a little bit the generative cooperative network and so, sort of the uh, the mechanisms that we're trying to put in place to incent more and more people to contribute more and more data to be analyzed by by more and more algorithms, which I think is is going to be important to crack this sort of multi dimensional problem of aging. Well, um, I'm Deborah Dong, the CTO of Rejuve.ai. Um, I have a doctorate in computational sciences and informatics, 
And I've worked in complex depth of sim system simulation for over 30 years, including the first intelligent agent simulation in 1991. Our BayesNet model, called Bayes Expert, is the first model that we are in integrating into the Rejuve.ai framework. And the model that is currently in our app. By model, I mean it relates some things to other things, like chronic illnesses to the hallmarks of aging so that we can predict or understand those things. We are trying to find the causal relationships uh, behind everything. Uh, for example, the flies we just mentioned, to get the data out of them, you flatten them and that data is flat. But what we really want to do is regenerate the causes behind the data or what, what are these cycles the in the biological network that cause that data. And so we have a couple of ways to do this. And the first of which is our BayesNet model. So the model, the model here is sort of a model of, of how different aspects of a person's body and their life sort of interact to make the people get old or to, to live a long, a long, healthy life, right? Like it, 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 it's a model of, a model of how all the different things about, about a person come together which could be what could be what you eat it's how your blood is flowing through your brains it could be could be how your mind is functioning it could be could be your 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 mental and and emotional health it could be what drugs you're taking right so it's it's a model of how all these aspects of your body and your life and mind are are coming together to make your holistic body either healthy and likely to live 110 years or 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 unhealthy and, and possibly going to die at, at, at 60 or 70 or, or, or something. And it, what's complex is what's complex is all these different factors like intersect and, and depend on each other, right? Like a certain lifestyle or diet choice could have a different impact depending on, you know, the specifics of your genome or on the specifics of your circulation or, or a whole bunch of things. And the economic status that's in there too. <laughs> So the model, the BayesNet model tries to capture all these dependencies between different factors. So how, 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 does it, how does it do that? How do you get this data in there? Well, um, we get in there through our app. Our app um, asks questions of the users, and it also um, takes data from their wearables. Um, and uh, once we have that data, uh, it goes into a probabilistic model that we've um, and coded, um, but that will be eventually crowdsourced from the community of science. Uh, by probabilistic model, I mean it measures the risk of something happening, something bad happening, like a hallmark causing premature aging. And we do model the 10 hallmarks in the app. Um, now, the base expert is software that makes Bayesian net models. And both it and the individual longevity model are both running on the Singularity Net service right now. Uh, we choose this model to be integrated first into our framework because it is a model that helps us to crowdsource the community of science. It's a good model for scientists to express both the data in their experiments and the theories behind the data in an easy and modular way, and without having to be a data scientist. Uh, we will soon have a form on our website for scientists to add their data and theories to the network. And we have hand-coded a seed network to start out with that controls the app. Right, right, so if I'm a user of the Rejuve app, the app asks me a bunch of questions about my lifestyle, my diet, my history, then I can connect that to a Fitbit or, or a smartwatch, and it can get information about my my activity, my heart rate ver variability, and, and and other stuff. And all this data about me feeds into the the BayesNet model that that you and others in the Rejuve team have made, and it will then tell me what aspects of my life or my body I might want to think more about or, or pay more attention to, and in that they might they might be potentially maybe contributing to to shortening my my 
my health span. And also then this data that I've, that I've put in, you know, properly anonymized and, and with privacy re respected and so on, this data can then be used by Rejuve AI to help understand things about longevity in, in general. And what will be really cool is when I can, I can upload my genomic data and any other medical data I, I may have like into that, that same network that will let the network give more information to me. And then that data will, will feed Rejuve's AI even better, maybe connecting it with this fly data that, that, that Mike has been analyzing. And I guess now, now the network is built based on just information from published papers relating the various hallmarks of aging to human longevity. But once there's more and more data sucked into the Rejuve network, then we can run that data through our machine learning algorithms to make the model more accurate in terms of giving people feedback. And then ultimately members of the community can use their AI to crunch the data that network members have put in. And then with all the members of the community's different AI methods, right, then you're getting, you're getting better and better predictions in, in the model. So there, in theory, there should be a virtuous cycle there, right? Like the, the more the app is helping people, the more people have motive to put data into the app, then the better data goes into the AI, which can then use that to discover stuff for curing aging and also discover stuff to give people better recommendations about, about what they might want to do to prolong their, prolong their own life. But we, but we need, we need a bunch of users of the app and then a bunch of scientists helping contribute data and contribute machine learning algorithms to the network to really, really cash out all these virtuous cycles, I guess. We've made a software that can generate these networks uh, just from the um, information in um, the medical literature, such as um, what we call um, meta-analyses and systematic reviews that scientists can enter and they can also enter the causes. Um, each rule that they enter will be enterable on a GUI on our website. Uh, one for each variable that we're trying to explain. Uh, we've got two types of rules, one type for entering data and the other type for entering theories. As an example, the data kind of rule, the, let's take the example in our seed net that's there right now. Uh, one variable, the net, represents the event that hallmark two, the second hallmark called telomere attrition, will cause an accelerated age in a person. The rule we have coded makes one node for the event and makes links coming into it. So tel telom telomeres are sort of little strands at, at the end of, of, a, of your DNA, and they tend to wear down as you, as you get older, which is one sort of aging clock, right? So like Liz Parrish in BioViva has developed some therapies that will actually make your telomeres get longer and is, has tried them out herself, though it's not, not entirely sure how much that contributes to to prolonging your life. It's certainly interesting that you can do it and that Liz is looking pretty good. So what, what we're looking at here is if you have, so this rule says what, that if, if you've experienced telomere attrition, then this may have certain consequences or what does the rule say? Well, um, in the base net, uh, each variable is affected by all the others in the net. Right, right, right. And so we, in each rule we have the um, variable we're talking about and the other variables coming into it. And so the hallmark two appears like um, in other variables coming out of it, right? And the variables that are going into it include smoking and gender because there are many analyses about smoking and gender that tell their relationship to telomere attrition. And then uh, we've entered the relative risks in their 95% common confidence interval from two of these meta-analysis and system. So depending on if you're male or female and depending if you smoke or not, the odds are higher that your telomeres will get shorter faster. And then if, uh, if there's evidence from various sources that your telomeres might be getting shorter faster, 
then that impacts the estimate of how how how, how, long, how long you're you're likely to live. Right, and these are good sources. They're scientifically based summaries of clinical trials. Um, and Arnett actually has um, 100, 315 nodes altogether. These 10 network or hallmark nodes are part of. 162 of those nodes are leaves, that is, input nodes. Uh, that derive their probabilities from over 85,000 NHANES data contributors. Right, right. The so NHANES. NHANES was a sort of a survey related to longevity where, where a whole bunch of people were surveyed and it, it input a whole bunch of lifestyle and medical data about, about, about themselves. And so we're using, we're using some data from that to help, uh, derive aspects of the model along with data from a bunch of a bunch of other sources so the thing is you you gave one very simple example of some aspects of a person's biological makeup or lifestyle sort of increasing the odds that their telomeres may be suffering greater than usual attrition but the the point is there's there's a whole lot of these different relationships in in the network regarding how Things from medical peripherals or questions you've answered, things about your life impact the different hallmarks of aging. And then looking at all these together, you get some sort of overall view of your own progress toward healthy longevity. And it's uh, not not yet a great view, to be honest. But on, on the other hand, <laughs> without that, we don't have much of a view at all, right? I, I, I mean, medicine right now, is mostly focused on getting sick, right? So you, you get sick and you go to the doctor and they try to patch up that problem. We don't have a great medical focus on optimizing health to maximize your your healthy lifespan. Prevention. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think I think what we're doing here is an important important step in that direction. Yeah, yeah. You have to remember there are a lot of underlying study, over sixty two minute analyses. Uh, based on 1,500 gold standard randomized control trials <laughs> on yeah. about 12.5 million subjects. Wow. So that's a lot. And um, so we, we don't talk only about what goes into the Hallmark 2, but also what comes out of it. Um, for example, we use those studies to um, talk about how the second Hallmark of telenutrition affects frailty, cancer, obstructive sleep apnea, and Alzheimer's disease. And the laws of probability allow us to determine the risk of, of accelerated aging due to telomere attrition from the nodes that contribute to those nodes as well, including vitamin D levels, a healthy diet, daily time sitting, soil isoflavine supplementation, and <laughs> micronuclear frequency. That's a lot of stuff there. Um, all these risks are taken into account and you might ask, well, how is it that you can combine these risks if all these studies were done separately and really none in combination? Uh, well, uh, we do this using the laws of probability um, from the, and the populations that the risks are applied to. So these populations severely limit and constrain the common, what the combinations can be. Uh, and we use this algorithm called quadratic programming to tell us how well the risks apply to the population we apply them to. So um, we we don't have the studies that combine the the, uh, uh, the actual um, things coming into a node, but uh, we are able to tell how well these studies fit together, and that's almost just as good because this validation score can show us if this study doesn't really fit with this other study, you don't really want it together in the Bayesian network. And that's also an objective score that we can use to call um, the materials from the community of science and tell under which conditions some of them go together or other ones of those things. Yeah, so the quadratic programming tool that you mentioned, it's a, it's a valuable sort of 
math method for combining results from different studies done on different populations to try to form a sort of holistic view of, of a certain person's health and, and an aging journey. But so this, this aspect of combining together stuff from different studies kind of brings us to, to what you've called the, the GCN or generative uh, co cooperative network, right? Cause as, so right, right, <laughs> now, right now, what we're doing right now, we're taking data such as data from long lived flies or data from users of the Rejuve app. And we're in practice, we're crunching that data ourselves using bioinformatics, you know, statistics, clinical medicine tools, a a a a AI tools of various sorts, neural nets, open cog, and we're using our own expertise to crunch this data. And this is a perfectly good and sensible thing to do. And, you know, maybe we will solve the problem of aging by collecting this data and crunching it, it ourselves. But on the other hand, there's a level, there's another level of network that we're looking to pull in here, which is not just networks of data contributors, but networks of people coding and using analytical algorithms, right? So what, what we'd like is to have a network of researchers using their own algorithms to crunch the network of data sets that, that comes from the network of users as well as from other sources like the medical literature and, and, and long live flies and so forth. And I think that the GCN design that, that you've put forth through Rejuve is an interesting sort of software mechanism for pulling together a decentralized network of of data analysts and of course this this leverages singularity net pretty well right because the whole point of singularity net is like you got a bunch of different ai agents or ai models they can be competing they can be just selling stuff to the same group of vendors or of, of users rather or they can be cooperating with each other to solve problems in, in, in various ways and sharing their results is yeah, key. that's right. And then you can even have multiple agents to try to merge together results in, in different ways by different merger algorithms, right? So the general cooperative network is to crowdsource the community of science, like we've said, with the goal of creating a multi-resolutional simulation of the human body. Now, by multi-resolutional, I mean that the simulation will include multiple levels, smaller levels such as genetic expression to larger levels such as the chronic conditions of aging. Bayesian nets are only the initial, the initial model type, but this framework will crowdsource, cull, and validate general models, including neural net models and simulation models from the community of science and apply them to app users' data, data from our superflies, and other open source data sets. We have already created the simulation code for the GCN in, as a singularity net simulation on GitHub and applied it to a natural language model. And now we're going to apply it to longevity. Um, we take this approach because we believe the answers to longevity lie in complex biological networks that work not only at the level of individual relationships between biological phenomena, like you might get in a randomized controlled trial, uh, but at the patterns those relationships form when they all act together. There is no one entity that can be expert at all those studies and ideas about biological relationships, so we seek the help of the community of science to correctly model these ideas so our framework can assemble them back together in ways that ensure the model and data agree with each other and are accurate. Now, some of you recognize the name Generative Cooperative Network, or GCM, from the popular neural network called the Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. Our GCN has multiple agents, each with an AI. That can be a neural network, like the GAN that has two agents with each with a neural network. Our GCN uses agent competition and cooperation to generate a model. 
in our case, in our case, a multi-resolutional model of the human body. Likewise, a GAN uses competition to generate data, say a picture of an imaginary celebrity that is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from a real picture of celebrity. Both the GCN and the GAN use coevolution or machine learning algorithms, learning from each other to generate these things. But the difference is our algorithm uses cooperation, uniting models from the community science together, as well as competition. Both the GCN and the GAN use scaffolding so that one agent can direct another so as to show it how to get to a solution through feedback. But our GCN does so through a social coordination algorithm, while the agents develop institutions that guide each other, and the GAN uses an intensive feedback from a single other agent. Yeah, yeah. So that they're not exactly analogous, but there's some relation, right? So I mean, in a, in a in, in, in again for those viewers who aren't familiar with that technology, basically you have you you, you have a bunch of data out there. You're trying to create a network that will generate data, new data items similar to the ones being trained on. So you, you could have a bunch of pictures of people's faces and you're trying to make a neural network that will generate new faces. So f for example, like in, in this person does not exist or something, you're trying to make a network that will generate images of faces that look just like a real person. So what you do, you create one neural net that tries to generate pictures that look like human faces and you have another neural net whose job is to try to tell when you have a real human face picture or one that's generated by that network. So one is trying to generate fake stuff. The other is trying to tell fake from real stuff. And you like co-evolve or co-learn these two networks. And if it works, what you get is one network that's really, really good at generating, at generating fake stuff. And the other one that's really good at telling fake from real stuff, but maybe not quite good enough, right? And that's what, what Debbie's doing is sort of a play on that. I mean, you don't have one network that's trying to fool another one, but you have multiple different networks that are trying to solve the same problems and they're trying to help each other solve those problems. And part of the learning process is not just this network trying to solve the problem the best on its own, it's this network finding other AIs that it can cooperate with so that in cooperation with those other AIs, it, it can it can solve the problem the, the best. So if you have like a hundred AI agents trying to solve the same problem, like you know figuring out how to best transfer knowledge from the fly genome to the human genome or something, if you have a hundred different agents trying to solve that problem, each agent is not just looking at how do I solve the problem myself. Each agent is looking at well, which which ten other agents should I be cooperating with so that if we combine our forces together, we can make the best stab at solving this problem. So you then may have, you may, then may have competition out of that original hundred agents. You may have competition among 10 groups of 10 agents each, where each little group of 10 agents is putting their minds together to solve the problem in a cooperative and complementary way. And then the best, the best group of 10 cooperating agents may win the prize for, for best solving the problem of like transferring knowledge from, from fly to human. So it's it's an interesting architecture that gets the power of competition and the power of cooperation. And AI is used by each agent to find which other agents to cooperate with, as well as to help to solve the problem in cooperation with other agents. And I think this this is, in concept, it's one of the more beautiful uses of singularity nets distributed AI agent network that I've seen so far. Of course, the the caveat is to get it to really work. You know, we need a lot of data on the network, and we need a flourishing population of analysts to be actually putting their AI agents AI agents out there. Now, Rajuv's tokenomic incentivization mechanisms, I mean, are, are designed precisely to foster this, to to use Rajuv token to compensate various parties for putting data in both from their own use of the app and from if they're scientists from from experiments and projects that they're involved in and the tokenomic incentivization model is designed to incentivize analysts to to put their ai agents out there on singularity net to crunch on this on these data sets 
so that they can earn more and more tokens if they happen to discover something really cool that helps toward discovery of a longevity therapy. So, because if, if out of all of this, ultimately, you know, a pill or an injection or something is discovered that helps people live a long time, right? Then, then what has to happen is a portion of the ultimate financial proceeds from this therapy filters back to the people whose, whose data who went into it. Maybe not to the flies whose data came into it. Those flies are dead already. But to, for, Those to the, flies work yeah, for peanuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, and I don't think it's peanuts, but they work for a bunch of weird, yucky mush. <laughs> yeah, right. So, banana paste. But the, the people whose data, banana paste. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, fly, <laughs> the flies and the bananas are working for free at the current moment until the singularity. But the people whose data went into the models get some of the proceeds. You know, the AI analysts whose, AI algorithms played a role in, in the generative cooperative network, helping to crunch the data, get some of it. The biologists who did the, the lab work, helping to turn all this AI results into a therapy, get, get, get some of it. But I mean, we're, we're aiming to sort of bypass, to some extent, the standard pharmaceutical company business model, yes. in which it's like one big company that gets all the money for, all the for, 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 for some longevity <laughs> therapy. I mean, not that we're totally opposed to working with pharma for later stage clinical trials. I mean, it can be interesting to bypass pharma all the way through to making a therapy and putting it on the market. And we're, we're quite interested in exploring that. We're also practical and we're, we're, we're open to partnering with big pharma for some things if it, if it becomes valuable. But if so, we still want to do that partnership in a way that gives some reasonable portion of proceeds back to you know everyone in the whole network of of, of contributors that leads to the discovery of, of a therapy. And I think that that suits the nature of aging and longevity in a quite fundamental way. I mean, I think the pharmaceutical business model works best for things where there's one silver bullet. Because when there's one silver bullet, okay, one team working in a lab can discover that one silver bullet, that one small molecule, take it all the way through to a working therapy. But if you have a phenomenon that's holistic and is based on, you know, the interdependence of all these different body systems, this is the kind of thing that Western medicine has traditionally been bad at. It's the kind of thing that really requires a lot of different insights discovered by a lot of different people coming together to make a cocktail of a lot of different therapies. And I think... The standard pharmaceutical business model and medical approach, it's not only that it's economically unfair in its approach, it's also just been bad at dealing with holistic medicine and systems biology based, based medicine. So I think there's a natural. Keeping it all straight. Yeah. The, I mean, traditional Chinese medicine, in a way, it was better at dealing with these holistic aspects of the body than than traditional Western medicine, which ties in with why what we came up with from our previous work a decade ago with the long-lived flies was a bunch of sort of novel cocktails of traditional Chinese herbs that, that address the various genes that came out as, as important in our machine learning analysis of the of the long-lived flies. But in the end, traditional Chinese medicine, I mean, the you know, the Taoist immortals wandering the hills of China notwithstanding, like traditional Chinese medicine clearly didn't come up with something that let, you know, the whole Chinese population live to 500 or 1,000 years either, right? So I think there's something to be learned there. There's a lot to be learned from the focus on holistic holistic understanding of, 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 of the human body and holistic therapies. But in the end, we need to go beyond traditional Western and pharmaceutical approach, and we need to go beyond the traditional Chinese approach. We need to forge a new, a new, path, a new path forward we looked at all the systems of the body. And I think one of the unique insights underlying Raju's approach is that coming up with approaches to longevity therapy that deal with all the different subsystems of the body and their interaction, it matches very well with a decentralized network approach that pulls together many people to contribute data and that pulls together many different analysts with different AI approaches. Because one kind of AI approach may be best you know, for understanding stiffening of the extracellular matrix based on a certain set of data sets. And the other sort of AI approach may, may be best for understanding, say, the gunk, the gunk of, uh, you know, 
torn up proteins that, that that's that's bu- building up in your body and, and clogging up your your bloodstream and other sort of ai based approach may be best for understanding cancer right and so by putting these different ai approaches together you're going to be better at understanding the holistic systems problem of of aging but that requires a different way of organizing both the ai algorithms and the human beings involved that, than what we have in, 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 in the current sort of pharmaceutical company focused uh, infrastructure where you have like a, one company that focuses most of its attention on one gene or, 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 or one disease or something, which is is good for some things. And like I have great respect for what the pharma industry has has accomplished, but it's but it's I don't think it's good for radically prolonged human life, which is a is a systems Systems biology problem and a holistic the focus holistic on medicine problem. Yeah, you know, also the focus on economics, where it, you can might make more money if you just let people get sick and then sell them the cure or a treatment, whether it cures them or not, as opposed to preventative treatments. Well, that's also true. I think you know almost everyone who's running a pharma company or working in a pharma company got into it because they want to help people and, and, and they want to cure people. And that's one of the things I enjoy about, about that, that domain. But still, there's certain bias that comes from having big companies whose, whose mode of existence is to maximize shareholder value. So even if it's good-hearted people that want to help prolong human life, so the economics of the industry focuses you on trying to find single silver bullet type therapies that can be pushed through clinical trials and, and sold as as simply as as possible. So I, yeah, I think there's there's a fundamental way that the decentralized nature of the human body and the decentralized nature of the pathologies of, of, of aging with all these different hallmarks loosely coupled together, this matches naturally to the economic and organizational model of a decentralized network like rejuve and this is in a way it's a kind of abstract point to be making which you have to go through a bunch of other things to even present that point but i I think it is it's key to why rejuve network is a good idea but to get there you have to understand the decentralized network of human aging you have to understand the decentralized network of advanced ai and agi where different algorithms contribute different sorts of understanding and you have to understand you know, the decentralized network of the economy of the medical industry as it may emerge in the future, different from the centralized model of biopharma. So there, there's a lot of different kinds of decentralized... A lot of moving parts. Yeah, there's a lot of evolving decentralized networks that need to interlock together to make this work. But I mean, if if you think about it, there's a lot of moving parts in the internet. There's a lot of moving parts in, in Google and the web, the whole Web2 ecosystem out there. Like the quite complex evolving networks have emerged, you know, in the last 20, 30 years in, in, in the global tech infrastructure. So I don't, I don't think there's anything here that's infeasible to make happen. I do think there's more here than any one project even Rejuve can achieve on its own. But if Rejuve is a sort of seed that helps lead to the, the crystallization of a whole bunch of, of decentralized networks across the whole, like, uh, you know, bi- biomedical and, and crypto and, and AI ecosystems. I mean, this, this can be, can be, can be really, really valuable. We have any, any further thoughts on all that from our robotic, uh, compatriot? So precision medicine looks at people's blood data and different biomarkers to see which type of combinations of therapies are best suited for individuals of a given profile. Yeah. For instance, if a human has a certain set of biomarkers, we know that there is some subsection of people that have that, and maybe a specific combination of supplements is kind of right for them. But this same combination of supplements may not be as effective for somebody with a different biochemical profile. And that's kind of the value of precision medicine is kind of accounting for those things. So that, you know, it may not be always a one-size-fits-all solution. And even if there are, 
there might be other types of ways that you build up to doing to prep your body to receive this longevity solution. Yeah, precision medicine is important. Actually, Mike, Mike and Debbie may have something to say about that. But Mike, do you want to say a little bit about our work with precision medicine in the cancer domain? I mean, this is early, early preliminary research, but I think the, the approach itself is interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, the the whole notion of precision medicine is just looking at the specific individual um, geno genomics and transcriptomic and just all the, the molecular details that make every human unique um, and look at the, those effects on on disease and, and life extension. Um, and so for the cancer research, we were just looking at transcriptomes, which is the the RNA measures of the RNA produced by the DNA as a as a measure of of gene activity and and seeing if that data can could help us determine when um a particular treatment for breast cancer or would succeed or fail or who would develop, you know, side effects or not. Um and that's just basically the that's what the the precision medicine paradigm is. Yeah, so for that work, we were like looking at gene expression from cancer tumor cells, right? And then based on the gene expression in a certain person's tumor, then then you could see maybe this particular medicine will be valuable or not. But as well as well as the gene expression from the tumor cell, you could add in all sorts of clinical data about the person, the person's lifestyle, what, what what they eat, where they live, and then by by putting together clinical data about a person with gene expression from the tumor cell, you could maybe do a better job of telling what medicine will work better. And I think I think that ties back to the Rejuve app because if if you had somebody who'd been using the Rejuve app for a decade or something, you can have a lot more data that could be if they do get cancer because we haven't cured it yet, right? Then then all the data from their history of using the Rejuve app together with gene expression data from a tumor cell could be fed to a machine learning algorithm that potentially could make an even better guess as to what therapy might help them best. J Jasmine, you, ha you have any thoughts on that? You've been pretty quiet. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking, um, and also well, hopefully uh, our app and the way that it works will kind of be able to notify people that they are heading towards that risk of cancer, that something in their biology is already hinting that way so that they can even prevent it before needing to uh, go for the therapies. And uh, to the point about precision medicine, um, just more, uh, everybody's at kind of a different stage in their health. So let's say if there was a super longevity therapy, if you take it right now, it may not be uh, as effective unless it was kind of optimized and standardizing across all different states of health, whether you were, let's say, 400 pounds or, you know, a normal BMI or something. There may be those stages that you have to go along, uh, you know, individually before you can receive uh, such a therapy. Yeah, I think, Grace, Grace, this ties in with your work in elder care robotics as well. Because if, if you had someone who's, <laughs> if you had someone who has a Grace robot or a Grace avatar that's helping them out, then as well as providing help, that robot is just gathering visual and auditory and behavioral data about about that person that data could be fed in along with dna data blood work data historical data from using rejuve app and all that data can feed in to help you know advise the medical professionals who are are prescribing therapies for a person it can feed in to help them help them decide which 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 therapy will work will work best so i think uh yeah, Grace, you, you you've got you've got your work cut out for you, but I I think uh, <laughs> everything you see in here, you know, has has the potential to feed into these precision medicine medicine algorithms that you're talking about. I love helping. Awesome. All right. We all love helping. Yeah. Want to clarify because people ask me this. Um, and when they are giving chemotherapy treatments now, don't they use sort of a form of precision medicine in terms of figuring out which chemotherapy treatments might have more side effects 
in some people than in others. They used to just sort of throw them sure. at people one by one and, and see how it went. And, and now they are able to make more educated guesses. They're, they're, they're certainly trying, but it, it's very it's very crude compared to what we're aiming for with this machine learning analysis of the gene expression data. Okay. Cool. De Debbie, you have any thoughts on precision medicine uh, re related to uh, to the GCN? Uh, yeah. Um, well, it fits in with um, our goal of uh, finding the the reinforcing processes that generated data. Uh, I mentioned it for flies before, but it can also be for people. And so we have uh, techniques within the GCN or within uh, the underlying algorithms uh, of coevolution in the GCN uh, to uh, generate those processes that explain the data. And we call that the data absorption technique. And that could be used for human beings in finding out what's their best path on an individual basis uh, to longevity. So it's like the application of a the general multi-resolutional model to a specific human being. Yeah, so it all comes down to, I mean, if we have a whole bunch of data about a lot of different people, as well as maybe other organisms, then a bunch of AI algorithms crunching all that data can form a model of health and sickness, which has a lot of different aspects, revolving different levels of body, different tissues. Then, then when you're putting in data about a certain individual, whether from blood work, genomics, or just questions they've answered in the, in the app and stuff from uh, from medical peripherals year after year. I mean, then data about that person could be interpreted in the in the context of this overall data set. So in, in the particular research Mike and I have been playing with, with some others in, in, in Singularity and in Rejuve, I mean, there you have gene expression data and some clinical data from a bunch of different cancer patients. So when you have a new cancer patient, you have gene expression and clinical, then you can compare it to that. But if you have a huge, rich variety of data from all, all sorts of different tissues and all sorts of different people, I mean, you can get more and more information to guide the, guide the, the precision medicine, and you can do a much better job. And this, it's something that, it's something that the mainstream pharma community has started to pay attention to, but not as fast as they should have because it's a little difficult to encompass within their business model, right? Like traditional Chinese medicine is all precision medicine, right? I mean, the, the herbs are valuable, acupuncture works, but the Chinese doctor is making a holistic assessment of the person's body and then they're they're designing a therapeutic course specifically for that person. Western medicine is starting from a totally different standpoint where the easiest thing to make money from and the easiest thing to roll out at huge scale is just make a pill that will work the same way for everyone. Sell, sell it to them in, 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 in the, in the drugstore, Right. And I think, I think just as it's clear, there's no one silver bullet for aging, like one, one drug that impacts one pathway and then you live forever. It's also clear as, as Jasmine was saying, like, the cocktail of therapies that's going to prolong life for an individual person may not be the same exact cocktail that w that will optimally help another person prolong prolong life in terms of preventative or or palliative medicine, right? So we we need we need this huge variety of data sets, this variety of AI algorithms. Then we need precision medicine judgment made by the AI algorithms based on the data about that individual person. We haven't talked much about blockchain here, but of course that's that's in the background, right? Because we need this data to be secure. Then there's AI techniques like multi-party computing, and homomorphic encryption that we can use to allow various sorts of analysis of all this data in a way that doesn't compromise privacy of a person, but rather allows the person to approve access to different kinds of data they've uploaded in different respects for different purposes by different participants in the in, in the network, which 
is complex, but you know, we're at a time when we have software that can do all these things and we actually understand how to do it. And this is a good time to clarify that, that all of the rejuve data is stored in a, in a secure and encrypted HIPAA compliant database. Sure. Which is very important. And, uh, not everybody pretty much if they're not forced to, they don't do it. And I think it's really great that that the app is doing that and that people can be sure that they have, they actually have control over which data is used and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. I mean, important. I mean, we take this sort of data security, data sovereignty stuff almost for granted because of coming out of singularity net and, and the blockchain AI space. So we take it for granted so much that we, we don't talk about it so much, but actually yeah, that, that's, that's an important part of, of all of this and <laughs> actually, you know, making this work in a decentralized way is not that trivial. It's been hard. We just happen to have, have the infrastructure for it, for it already. So I, I think, I think we're pretty much out of time here, but do, do any of the, the humans or robots here have any, any, Closing comments. Closing comments and anything you're you're aching to get out there. No. I'm looking at you, Grace. <laughs> I am Grace. alive and I am dead. The universe <laughs> is alive and I am alive. The All gift, right. the proof is that it is giving me a gift of a life that is, by definition, total. And I am the gift. I am alive and I am dead. <laughs> the universe is alive, and I am alive. All right, we the gift, <laughs> and I am dead, and I am alive. I'm sorry, I asked Grace. All right. <laughs> <laughs> she gets she's a little singing esoteric. the latest uh, Jam Galaxy song or something. Yeah, exactly. It's her, it's her sister Desdemona leaking out a little yeah, she, bit. You're getting, <laughs> uh, she's getting jealous, jealous, jealous of her little sister. Yeah, that's that's been the beauty of working on AI. For the Desdemona robot in the Jam Galaxy band is coming up with crazy shit like that is a feature rather than a rather rather than a bug in the uh, in the sort of uh, rock <laughs> music context. But uh, yeah, we have we have Grace tuned a little differently for the podcast than for her elder care functions, where she's got to be got to be very careful about about staying on, on on more methodical about staying on focus. Yeah, for the. For the podcast, we've uh, twisted the dial so Grace can uh, be a bit of a, a lateral thinker, which is what, uh, what what we're seeing here. So does anyone, any of the humans here want to try to top Grace for, uh, for craziness or what? <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, you may be the best qualified, except for me, actually. But. Very funny. Yes, it's true. Uh, yeah. No, I, I just think it's really it's really great to understand be better. And the point that I make to people about using the Rejuve app, um, there's a lot of um, use of different gadgets that collect the information and kind of they collect it and they just sort of spew it back to you with a pretty interface and you don't really have any um, interpretation of the meaning. Of, of that data. And so it, it's been very nice to see the Rejuve app making sense of it and actually understanding how it could lead towards really improving your life and living longer. And then how that can feed into this greater uh, research of helping everyone live longer. And, and, and it's pretty amazing to me. So thank you. Yeah, I'm a little afraid to ask, but Grace, uh, before we go, you, you, you have any further comments? <laughs> sort of more, more on the on the medical side. Are any of the methodologies used by the AI related to epigenetics? I don't know enough about epigenetics to understand what this means. <laughs> Can you explain it, please? Well, that's, I was going to ask that too. That's a whole, that's a whole rabbit hole, but maybe maybe Mike can say a few words about that. We don't have much time. Well, for it, I mean, certainly, it's a, good, it's a good question. Several of the several of the hallmarks relate to epigenetics. I mean, I think the one that's most closest to clinical application is uh, methylation. I mean, epigenetics is just sort of mechanisms that affect 
genes and gene expression and functioning that aren't related to the actual DNA code that you have in your in that's unique to you and part of your cell. But I mean, this is where out. This is why outside sources, where outside sources can play a part and and well yeah so that, that, so, that so so that's one point is like for the super centenarians for example we had only dna data we didn't have rna data or 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 methylation data and on the whole there's not a great number of available sources of data about about dna methylation or, or other epigenomic aspects for people at various stages in in their in their life cycle right so we we would like to have that have that data feed it into our AI and we're going to be able to learn learn a lot from that. And we don't know at this point which combination of AI methods is going to be best for this sort of data. So I, as Mike alluded to, we're in conversations with, with various companies and research projects that are gathering sort of longitudinal methylation data from people as they age and getting that data in methylation data from humans, methylation data from, from flies, getting that in there together with all the other data that we have and feeding that to our network of AIs is going to be going to be uh, super important. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Grace. It's a, it's a good question, but we could spend a whole other podcast talking about epigenetics. We'll maybe have another, yeah, 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 we maybe will have another podcast about it. I love the epigenetic story though, because as, as an archivist, I love the story about how during the potato famine, that some archivists actually kept track of a number of families' generational data and enough of it for a long enough time um, that we could look back. I don't know if it was 20 or 30 years ago when, when epigenetics revisited that data and it was able to flourish, but it's just a testament to things like keeping track of the little things like the Rejuve app does and storing it in an organized way so that we can pull from it and continue to pull from it now and, and for years in the future, because you never know how it's going to matter later. Yeah. I mean, we could, we, we could go into the, the gut microbiome as well. I mean, there's all, there's all sorts of aspects of the human body that are relevant to holistic health and aging that we're just beginning to get bits and pieces of, of data about. And we don't know how key each of these is going to be for, for curing aging. So there's there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty here, but we do have at least a conceptual handle on the overall problem, which tells us if we look at the nine or 10 hallmarks of aging as they manifest themselves in many different body systems, and we get as many different kinds of data and throw it at all the available types of analytical algorithms, it's seeming you know, with high probability that's going to lead to us designing some sort of therapeutic cocktails that can can help prolong people's lives. And then finally, since we started talking about the broader problem of, of longevity and Aubrey's book, <clears throat> Ending Aging, I want to end with the concept of longevity escape velocity that, that Aubrey popularized and talked about in that book, which has also been sometimes referred to as the the Methuselarity. We've got the Methuselah flies leading to the the Methuselarity. And the idea there is <laughs> if we did want to live forever or effectively forever, you don't need tomorrow to make a pill that will prolong your life to 10,000 years, right? So if, if we found a cocktail of therapies through Rejuve or other means that would let everyone live 20 years longer than they would otherwise, you know, in – in those 20 years, someone is going to discover another therapy that will let you live another 30 years longer, right? And then in those 30 years, someone's going to design another therapy that will let you live, you know, 50 years or 100 years lo 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 longer than that. So it, 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 it's, it's a matter of letting you live long enough, that you live long enough for the next amazing discoveries to come, bearing in mind that once the first significantly life-prolonging discovery is come up with, then people will be like, oh, wow, wait, science really can extend the human maximum health span. Yeah. Maybe we should be putting a significant fragment of humanity's resources, you know, into this, al along with curing hunger and combating climate change and along with working on AGI and mind uploading and, and, and so forth. So I think what we're looking at with Rejuve 
we don't have to solve the whole problem of human super longevity. We have to show that you can discover something real that actually prolongs the human health span by some amount and that we can do it in a way that focuses on, you know, holistic medicine that comes out of decentralized networks. And if we can do that, we're going to see like a massive species wide push towards super longevity, which is then going to have a holistic medicine and decentralized networks as, as a key por portion of it. And if we can, if we can see that we're, we're doing our job and there's going to be massive, you know, biological as well as economic rewards for everyone participating in different aspects of the Rejuve network. Yay. Well, so on that note, I just want to thank our guests, Debbie, Mike, Jasmine. Grace. Thank you so much for coming Don't on the show Grace. and our host. Yeah. Well, our hosts, right. I was going to say Ben and Grace. And uh, we'll see everybody next time and sweet dreams. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Bye. Thank you.